super. Did everyone feel like they've absorbed kind of what we just went through? Because that was the hard part. That was the math. That was the cryptography. And it, now that you know that, you kind of have a great basis for, for everything else. And so that's good. Um, all right, cool. So we're going to go through this. And then we'll be set again. Really, the longest one, I promise, I will do for you guys. This is good stuff, though. I'm excited to share it. So, crypto investing. And in here, just look up Bitcoin investing. Ever seen pictures like these? <laughs> I see some smiles around the room. Bitcoin to the moon. Everyone heard? Yeah, so people are familiar with kind of stuff like that. Um, kind of close to it. But the question is, how do we actually, you know, figure out what's going on here? What's the value, and you know, how to appropriately allocate assets for optimal returns? I'll tell you the story. So a couple weeks ago, I was on this conference call with some other asset managers in the digital fund space, and yeah, there was this one guy. He did a, a venture fund, and I think he had like eight million under management. And he, he was asked to talk about kind of how he evaluates cryptocurrencies, how he evaluates projects, and how he invests in them. And he gave this very, very, very long, uh, very interesting talk about how you should just look at their social media followings. So this is a company, uh, not a company, but this is a project called Basic Attention Token. And his, kind of the thesis that a very large amount of investors kind of follow is just look at their social media followings. Look at how many followers they have on Reddit, how many people they have on Telegram, how many people they have on Twitter. So they don't use these platforms regularly. A couple of people, I had like never heard of most of these, like when I came into the crypto space a while back. And I was like, wow, this is the basis that a lot of people use. And it's really interesting because this is not usually how you value a company. The value that you think for Coca-Cola stocks, it has nothing to do with how many followers they have on Twitter. It's like completely unrelated. And so what we're going to see here is something kind of interesting in this kind of emerging space. Uh, now, this is just a big list of some of the top cryptocurrencies. Can we all agree that there are a lot, a lot of assets here? Uh, I get a headache just looking at this. Can, does anyone else get almost a headache kind of peeking at this? It is gross. There are so many. And it's very interesting. Because almost none of these are kind of like actual companies. They're all trying to do these really interesting things using the blockchain. And if we look at coin market cap, everyone familiar with coin market cap? Anyone not familiar with coin market cap? No? Okay, good. This place is great. They have like all the cryptocurrencies. They have all the pricing. They're like awesome. If we look at coin market cap, there's like 6,900 cryptocurrencies listed just on there. I mean, that's a lot. It is a lot, especially for asset space. That is, that is so young. So the questions that we want to look at is how do we evaluate these assets? And I have my very complicated top three factors here. These are very in-depth, extremely specific from decades of research. First thing you look at is, what do they do? Second thing, how do they do it? Third thing is emotion. Now you got to understand with most of these projects, they aren't exactly at the same level that the Bitcoin, because all Bitcoin really is, right, is just that ledger that we talked about, right? Just that big triple entry ledger. And a lot of these assets are, are similar in the sense that they're just big global public cryptographic ledgers. And a, a lot of them really aren't supposed to foundationally be investments. So it's really interesting to look at them as an emerging asset class and one that is extremely real. It was most of our fund for its entire lifespan. And so we're gonna look at two ways to invest in these assets and how to really value them. We'll look at fundamental and technical analysis, which are basically the two kinds of analysis you have on any investment ever. Uh, and to get into that, we need to focus on a concept that I've really never seen taught, and it's not something I learned until we were at least two years into running the hedge fund, when I, I really started to grasp this understanding on investing emotion, and it just changes all of the analysis that you do is it changes the perspective. It's like putting on sunglasses, right? So you'll put on your, your sunglasses, and depending on the tint of the sunglasses, it changes everything that you see about the assets you're analyzing. And that's kind of the, the mentality you want to come into when you think about investing emotion. So just to kind of set the stage here, we have sort of the most emotion. I think we can, has anyone here like, you know, spoken to venture capitalists, been around venture capitalists, heard of? Venture capitalists. Okay, a couple of. Okay, good, good, good. 
Um, there's a great story. The, everyone here kind of familiar with CreateX, the startup incubator. The founder, uh, he, uh, the one who leads it, you know, project director. Uh, I think I've heard his story about how he missed out on investing in Uber at Series A stage like at least six times, over and over and over again. Uh, and the reason why is because a lot of venture capital is very emotion based. A lot of it comes down to, for lack of a better word, good fortune, right? Some of the very early investors in Apple, any of these really big tech companies, I mean, a lot of it was just based on emotion and getting a little bit lucky and being in the right place at the right time. And when you've heard of the Apple shareholders, like one of the first investors, and he sold all of his shares in 1978 for $5,000 because he needed to make a payment or something. Yeah, that's kind of the level of emotion we're talking about. And then we get to individual stocks. These are just standard stocks, standard companies. These are emotional in the sense that they have a proven business, or they have a proven track record. You're not investing based on your emotional connection with some founder or some co-founder. But they are emotional in the sense that individuals will buy Johnson & Johnson stock because they like their products. They'll buy Apple stock because they like their products. They'll buy Facebook stock because they like their products, whatever it is. You have some product that creates some kind of emotional connection to people, whether it be in what the company does or what they stand for. A uh, great example of this, anyone here, was anyone here, does, you guys remember the time Elon Musk tweeted this? He said, I think Tesla stock's too high, the stock just tanked. Did you guys kind of remember that? Okay, I was, does anyone else trading on that day? I was trading on that day, I was trading Tesla stock on that day, and it was the wildest thing I had ever seen. I didn't know about the news until the market closed. I was trading it based on just technicals, and it was a nutty trade on, on, the, the, on, the, on the option. And that's because individual stocks have emotion built into them one way or another. Then you start to get into sort of, you're lowering the emotion, right? Lower, lowering, lowering the emotion. You start to get the ETFs. So everyone kind of familiar with what ETFs are? Like one person, dang, okay, a couple of people. Okay, so it's just a big group of stocks, right? So the S&P 500 is like 500 of the biggest stocks. You put them all together. It's kind of like a foundational thing, just all of the stocks grouped together. And when you just, by nature of, correlation and by nature of probability, when you group 100 companies or 500 companies or 50 companies, when you group them all together, there's much less volatility. And this emotion is very much minimized in larger ETFs because you have 200 companies. I mean, you're going to be emotional about 200 companies. To an extent, the answer to that is actually yes. If you look at just the market as a whole, which is usually just based on the SPY, the S&P 500 index and, and the like. A lot of times, especially with COVID, for you saw these emotional reactions in the market that were transpiring from you know fear of, of COVID to the ETFs, you know, they all crashed. Uh, but when we talk about ETF crashing, it's like maybe it goes down 10, 20%. When we talk about stock crashing, it's like maybe it goes down 40, 60%. When we talk about venture capital crashing, maybe it loses all of its value 90% of the time. Drastically different risk profiles because they're drastically different levels of emotion. But you'll notice here that emotion has a big impact on all of these investments. And I can speak to it firsthand, shorting the market with COVID. It's, it, it prevents a lot of great opportunities when you can understand the emotion will state that, that most investors are in. Then you start to get into the kind of tail end of the spectrum. Uh, so these are like commodity futures, all right? I, I have never met anybody that cries about the price of orange juice. I've never met a single person who is emotional about the price of oil or oil barrels. Like, nobody is particularly emotional about it. There's still a little bit of uh, this idea of investor emotions or thoughts, uh, because you have companies that kind of sometimes they need to contract out a couple thousand liters of orange juice or oil or meat just to operate their business. But usually it's pretty minimal. Uh, and so you'll see much, much, much less emotion in the commodities markets, in the futures markets. Are we all familiar with futures? Oh, everyone's, okay, okay, so just like contracts for like commodities and currency, stuff like that. Uh, and then at the tail end of the spectrum, we have Forex. So, anyone here ever heard of investing in Forex? Anyone have that friend that like, oh, you should invest in Forex? <laughs> Forex trading. Forex trading. Forex has, I, I would say from experience, it has the least emotion of effectively any asset, and that includes structured products, that includes all the derivatives, all the derivatives usually fall in right around here. Um, Forex is just no emotion because it's just money, you know, it's dollars for pounds. There is uh, almost no emotion in that. And even when you hear people talk about like the impact that this trade embargo is going to have, or this big news about this country passing this big law is going to have, 
I've seen a lot of those like big, like people are like, this is gonna be huge news. Some of those huge news announcements in the market, I've seen them execute over and over and over again. And guys, huge news in Forex is at the maximum, like a quarter of a percent. And that's really aggressive. That's like extremely aggressive. It's like almost nothing. Um, and so the volatility here in Forex is effectively null and it's just all technical analysis. And so if you take a step back and you think about how hard it is to invest in these markets or how easy it is to invest in these markets, a lot of times as we said with venture, it's, you know, it's a fair bit of luck and it's like, you know, I have this five step formula for is this a good startup company? It's like not, I, I don't wanna, I'm probably get some flame from this, but it's not like the, the hardest thing in the whole wide world to do. It's just a lot of work and it's a lot of practice that goes into it and figuring out, you know, but I'd say as you go down this list and you remove that emotion from the investing, at least from a technical point of view, these become the harder assets to trade. These are the assets that require more experience, more understanding of technical analysis. You can trade an individual stock based on if you think their earnings are gonna do well. Not so much with commodity futures uh, or some of these lesser emotional assets. And that's kind of the frame that I wanna come into as we talk about these crypto assets and how they fit into this frame of, of investing emotions. And as you see here, we have the most raw volatility down to the least raw volatility. So with venture capital, anybody here heard of a leveraged venture capital fund ever? One, okay, that's pretty cool. You gotta tell me about that after class. Usually venture capital funds, like 90% of their investments fail. And so you're never gonna borrow money to put in your venture capital fund because it's just, it's not gonna happen. Um, there's like effectively no large scale leverage venture capital funds. Compare that to say ETFs, and there are billions and billions and billions in leverage ETFs. I mean, you can trade ETFs that have five times leverage on the market or, uh, or other kind of derivations. You can definitely trade ETFs that have leverage of three times on the market. You can get like 50 to 60 times leverage on individual stock trading accounts uh, if you're really aggressive, but usually it's like two times leverage, that's kind of a lot. But as you start to get lower in the, uh, the raw volatility, the leverage starts to increase. So just the amount, you have like no leverage, you have like maybe two times leverage usually. It, 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 usually it's, it's pretty low leverage. Um, uh, there's a lot of really great fund managers. The one that teaches here ran a 60, uh, long short fund and his was 140% exposure. So it's about 40% leverage. Uh, and so that kind of gives you a perspective on where most of these hedge funds operate. It's usually in this lower leverage kind of space for the lower risk. Um, and so you have less leverage here because the volatility is a lot more. And then over on this side of the spark, on this side of the chart, this is where you get a lot of leverage. So the normal commodity futures contract is 25 times leverage. And most Forex brokers start at 100 times leverage. It's extremely common to trade at 1,000 times leverage. So you put in a dollar on a trade, and the broker puts in $999 because there's extremely low, it's very small movement. It's like one month you might see a 10% movement on the high end, it's extremely small. And so you can have a lot of leverage because there's a very low amount of volatility. So it's really important to understand how emotion plays into this because you remove that emotion, you remove a lot of the fast volatility and it affects the way that you trade. You'll see at a very nuanced level, we'll look at it in the next slide, the way venture capital, I'm just gonna kind of ignore from this point forward because you can't trade stocks on venture capital, you can't really look at charts. Uh, but for, for basically everything else, the way that these trade is drastically, they, they drastically differ. So with individual stocks, you have the most leeway. You have the most kind of bouncing back and forth between price ranges because you don't just have technical investors. You don't just have those hedge fund quant guys investing in the stock. You also have Joe Schmo who's just buying his favorite company. That has a lot of leeway and volatility in the movement of the assets. And that's exactly what we see here in sort of the cryptocurrency space. Everyone kind of familiar with Bitcoin futures? Anyone here, the headlines of Bitcoin futures came out in 2017, kind of around the time that everything was going crazy. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is nutty. Uh, that was at a time, you know, it used to be very early on, Bitcoin had just started, the whole space just started. It was much closer to this venture side of the chart. It was extremely volatile. I mean, you had no idea what it was going to do. Eventually, people started trading it, and eventually, kind of a market emerged around cryptocurrencies. I kind of like to look at Bitcoin and, and the other larger ones uh, for as sort of an index of the overall crypto market as an emerging asset space. It works really, really well. It usually is, is similar to the S&P in that it follows the market, 
and it's less volatile than the market generally. It's kind of the way it goes. Uh, and so that's really what you see with some of these assets. Uh, you also have futures contracts on Ethereum. And these futures contracts on both these assets enable investors to trade 20 times leverage. I've routinely traded 100 times leverage on these contracts. And they allow you to leverage those returns to, to a higher level than you normally have because trading Bitcoin in 2012 is extremely different than, than kind of how it is today in terms of the way that volatility works out. And so you'll see a lot of these assets sort of towards this space, but they still retain a lot of the properties of individual stocks. And they still bear a pretty similar resemblance to more project-based companies. And so this is where, I'm gonna slow down for a second. <laughs> I'm gonna take a, a step back. This is a really important distinction we need to make. And that's this idea of protocols, right? So you have like the Bitcoin protocol, the Ethereum protocol, everyone kind of familiar with like the big ones, it's like pretty common knowledge. Um, this is kind of built, this idea that you could execute programs on the blockchain, whoa. We really want to separate these protocols now from what we're starting to see emerge in the space, which are more so project-based or company-based projects. So like Filecoin, anyone here familiar with Filecoin? A couple people, okay, we'll deep in it. Uh, Filecoin is huge, they're very, I think they're still top 30 on coin market cap. And the whole idea is that you can have decentralized file storage. And there's a couple other projects similar to it. And so uh, when you invest in these tokens, it, there's kind of a gray area right now of really what these are, right? For a long time, kind of these assets were considered property. And then more recently, they've been classified as currencies. And now there's some laws around using them as a collateral for loans. And similarly, there's kind of a gray area around these crypto projects that are more so uh, based on this idea of this company. And so it makes the whole space you know, not really regulated and a little bit sketchy, especially when you look at how they're regulated. Because for effectively every project we're gonna look at, anyone here ever analyze just a normal company? <laughs> like two people, okay. <laughs> Uh, anybody ever read like a balance sheet or an annual report for a company? It lists all the money they've made, everything that they do, all these standard disclosures. Okay, good, cool, awesome. You guys are ahead of the curve. With crypto, that just doesn't exist. It, it, these companies do not have annual reports. Um, can we get a show of hands again? Who has bought crypto? I remember from the first day. You guys are really ahead of the curve. Like, you gotta understand, 95% of people in America, and this is based on a recent study, don't, like they've never touched digital currencies. It just never crossed their mind. And so you're really ahead of the curve here. And what I mean by that is that most of these assets aren't at all disclosed, like what they do. A lot of investments are based off reading a white paper and looking at a Twitter, how many followers they have on Twitter. And it's just nutty, but of course, if anyone here has ever seen any chart of any cryptocurrency that is moderately popular, it has, you know, it works. It, and it's, uh, the reason why is really interesting, but at the core, it's because there are no central regulators around this. And so it really allows a very interesting market environment where for most of these assets, there's no way to bet against them. So with crypto futures, you can short the futures contracts and you can bet that it's gonna go down. For a vast bulk, and even for those futures contracts, it's very convoluted as to if you're actually trading the underlying asset usually you're not and it's kind of just like paper it's it's kind of interesting we could talk all day about it because those are implemented by centralized brokers and it, it's not very efficient and it isn't really uh authentic but for a vast bulk of the assets for those 6900 assets that we saw earlier crypto assets for almost all of them except for like the 20 of them that have futures contracts it's very difficult to short any of these investments. And there are a couple of brokers, there are a couple of like, you know, people that'll like sort of take your trade on it, but really they're, it's very, very, very sketchy. It, a lot of, anyone you're familiar with CFDs or binary options? Yeah, nobody, good, don't get into that stuff. It's messed up. <laughs> um, there are a couple of brokers that'll do stuff like that where you have synthetic derivatives, but for most of these assets, there isn't really like a real way to short them. And there's also, for most of these assets, not a natural seller of them, except for maybe like Bitcoin miners or, or miners for these protocols that use mine rewards. But for most of them, there is almost nobody s naturally selling them. 
Uh, and it's just people buying them for the sake that they go up and then kind of selling them. Um, and it's just a very interesting environment. One parallel that I, I kind of drew when we first got into the space, uh, when Bitcoin was going, the whole market was going from like a brand, two grand to you know, 20 fairly quickly. It's, it's kind of like the 1990s of internet technology. It's very similar to that kind of feeling uh, that you have with most of these assets in that they're not particularly developed, but a lot of them might have like some big potential of, and also like nobody really knows it. It's, it's a lot of speculation. Uh, and so just want to show you how these kind of map out. You have sort of these more established assets, you know, big ones around for uh, over a decade. And then you have sort of some newer ones uh, and this kind of gives you that range. So most of these investments are kind of more towards this venture capital side, the very early stage. And a lot of them are presenting really incredible new technology. And the question is, do you want to invest in this technology? Uh, and do you want to just hold that asset? And when I say hold that asset, the key difference here from effectively every other investment in paper assets is that you're not holding it at some broker, at some bank, you're not holding this piece of paper that is a share or something, but instead you're like you're, you're actually directly holding coins, directly holding tokens, directly holding these assets on the blockchain. And that's the difference that makes it so that you can, you can trade it anywhere. And it really opens up technology. And then you have kind of some newer ones they kind of are blurring the lines of where they fit into this whole scheme. Uh, but at the end of the day, they all have a lot of emotion tied behind them, just because they're all fairly, fairly new. And it shows in the way they trade. Um, have you ever traded candlestick patterns before? Well, yeah, okay. okay. It's like one person. Uh, two people, yes, okay. Uh, I'm not going to harp too much on candlestick patterns. I just wanted to give this one particular example. This is an example I've never really shared publicly before. Uh, and it, this is a pattern that I've noticed trading crypto markets and trading futures markets and trading forex markets that I never saw trading equities or options or standard financial markets. And it's this, so usually you'll have kind of this, this big downward move and then you have a hammer candle and then that's it, right? You have this hammer candle, this, it's just a big wick and it's got a small thing here some terms, it's not a big deal. It's a big wick, small little thing, it's like consolidation. And usually it just kind of goes right way up, right after that. Uh, usually this is kind of the emotional turning point. You have a lot of movement, a lot of volatility, and then it kind of whoops off in the opposite direction. With crypto, because you don't have those natural, you have a lot of people in most of these investments that have sort of a lot of it. And then also just the assets themselves are very interweaved with emotions and this idea of what do we think about this project because there are no facts to base your investment decisions on for most of these assets. You have a lot more volatility and this is just one particular example where that volatility comes into play even though in theory these should be like currencies, these should be more stable for, for some of them. Uh, this this candle right here, you have this huge sell uh, into uh, this, this massive dip and usually these are like 15 or 30 minute candle, this big sell off and then it consolidates back up and it, it does really, really well afterwards. My point in showing you this because I, I understand most people aren't really going to be, they're you know, not really in sync with the idea of candlestick trading. This isn't like the most incredible thing. For me, I could do this. This is like my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> but usually, in most markets that are logical, that have solid price action, you have a foundation of, I heard a net asset value. It's like if you have a mutual fund or you have like an ETF, it's like the sum of all the prices of all the stocks. That idea of some tangible value, uh, some PE, some amount of money that a company made last year, does not exist for most of these assets. And so you have these very drastic volatility shards that you just normally would not see in any kind of normal investment. And you would usually just have a straight bounce off up from here. And the reason they, I've seen this so many times, and it's, it's actually a really good trade. Um, and the reason why this happens is because you have that emotion or we just due to lack of information and most of the investors being really involved in the social presence of the project. Uh, and so now I'm going to kind of get into what we use for trading and what we use for investing and how you kind of base all of your decisions and most of your investment choices off of that. So for trading, most of what we use at the fund is technical analysis. It's about half price action and then another quarter indicator technical analysis. Uh, don't get freaked out by what I'm about to show you. It's not like the craziest thing. Um, but this is just kind of an example, I just screen grabbed this from this afternoon. This is just kind of an example of what technical analysis look like. 
It is just a bunch of pieces. So you got a couple people that know they've been in the game. Uh, it's just a bunch of charts. You're just staring at charts all the time, and it's super fun. It's like the coolest thing ever. Uh, but it's probably. Oh, you like that? Uh, yeah, I, I used those back in the day. Oh, man, they're great. I was on the projections, and you'd like see the word go, yeah. They're yeah. so much fun. The one very uh, red. Right. <laughs> the very red. Oh, oh, the order books, yeah. yeah. This is cool. This is stellar. So, this is actually a decentralized order book. It's really cool. Uh, you're trading. Peer to peer without a central middleman. It's actually really cool. Uh, but for what probably most people are going to go into this idea of investing, just investing, buying a coin, buying into a project, and just holding it for a while, not really actively trading it, that's where you start to get into you know a little bit of technical analysis just to time the entry. Um, we timed some of our Bitcoin entries really well in, in early 2017 using technical analysis, but at the end of the day, whether or not those investments did well didn't really matter uh, based on the entry. The entry was kind of trivial. It was just that icing on the top. Most of the principles in this kind of emerging crypto asset sector are going to come from project research. And the cool thing about project research is that it enables you to find kind of project, like this is just Bitcoin, it's like nothing, right? But if you were just like researching Bitcoin in 2010 or 2012, most of those people that you know took action on that research and were like, "Wow, this is cool technology," they ended up doing pretty pretty well. And so, what, oh my gosh, can we get to the slide that has this? Yes. So what we'll see here with the idea of research is you have a lot of companies that have, are kind of in this more venture capital early stage. And there's like almost really nothing to research on them. There's sometimes like one website, and that's their entire project. You'll be surprised. There's a lot of coins that are like that because it, it, you know, you can just you can just make a coin. Like it's uh, it's just you do some photography. It's like pretty simple. Um, and so as you start to come down this curve towards the more established projects, that's where you can really start to focus your research efforts. And what we're going to look for in that research is what we're going to talk about throughout on the rest throughout the rest of this course throughout the rest of the seminar is the, the protocols they're using, uh, and that idea of what they're doing and how they're doing it, right? Uh, there's some really important nuances in how these projects do whatever it is that they do. And a lot of times, as we see here, like some of these are extremely, like Solano, uh, Avalanche, these are very, very, these are billion dollar projects by market cap, and then somebody has decided to go out and just sell these coins one day. And uh, for a lot of them to, to drastically oversimplify it, there are just very minor tweaks in the idea of what is a triple entry cryptographic ledger. Uh, this is just a very minor tweak in how we form consensus and use trading machines uh, on a cryptographic ledger. And Solana is very similar. It's just an idea of different forms of consensus, different forms of cryptographic calculation. And that very minor tweak of how they implement it, which at the end of the day have big, big impact. Those minor tweaks in how a lot of the protocols, the protocols implement it, there's a huge difference in their valuation. Uh, and then for the ones that are more company based, more project based, it just comes down to project application. Uh, I do love trading though. Uh, these charts right here are my favorite thing ever. This right here is like my favorite thing ever. So it was like a couple people. If you do want to get one technical side, like I said, I'm not going to talk about the technical side. There's a great playlist on YouTube. It's got like all these great fundamental technical analysis. It's completely free. Uh, and then also there's my book, Three with Kindle. Uh, so if you're into more of the trading side of it, uh, or just investing in normal markets, that's kind of the route to go down. That is not what we're going to cover as we kind of go through this lecture, as we go through these seminars. Um, that's kind of more on the financial side. If you want to get more on the low level technical side of the cryptography and implementing the protocols and understanding the, the kind of the math, the crypto, and the low level protocol building, and you want to go out and work on protocol, build an application, or, or you know, uh, like I don't know, some of you guys could be really smart. The, uh, the next one, each company is worth five billion dollars because you went out and had a token. A lot of these are kind of nutty. They're like illegal securities. They're like unregistered securities offering. It's kind of nutty. <laughs> it's, it's super illegal, but you know, who could have said? Um, these are two really, really, really great books. These are free on GitHub and they're the super, and they'll get you down to the technical really quickly. And then here is where we start to get to more so the field of finding projects for investment. So a lot of times, because there are so many of these assets, at the end of the day, it just comes down to, to brute force. 
show of hands again, who has ever uh, read financial statements just for public companies? Have you ever made investment decisions on these financial statements? Anyone? No? Not so much? Yeah? How many cases have you read? How many uh, companies have you read about? What's the earning? Okay, revenue and stuff like that. So think about those financials, but for these, these crypto funds, these crypto companies, these protocols, a lot of times you're going to have kind of similar disclosures of what they're trying to do. You can just look up the project name and then the white paper. And that's really most of what uh, the investing boils down to is understanding what it is that they're trying to do. And a lot of times that's through a white paper. It's pretty much a standard way to do it in the market, in the industry. Uh, and so throughout the rest of the seminar, we're going to learn like what are the actual things to look for, what are the actual you know, things and strategies that these projects can use, these investments these points can use that they look out for, and how do you turn that into a, 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 a sizable, you know, reasonable, this is a good thing you're investing, how do you differentiate? That's kind of what we'll look at the rest of this, this course, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, and so that kind of brings us to the further ending point here. And that, and again, stressing that most of these assets are very new. Most of them don't have financials. So you do want to be careful to get into this space, in alternative space. And you know, that whole only invest that you can afford to lose adage, it, it does hold true here because a lot of these projects are, are very new. And it's, it's like investing in very early internet technology. You know, like some of it might be really, really well, and then some of it might be yeah, you know, not so much. So that's sort of the, the state of the industry because there really aren't many projects that are already on the market. But that doesn't mean that there's not many projects that have a very sizable financial background. Uh, if we just kind of finish up here and enjoy the Coinbase.com in its beauty, I mean, you can see, or sorry, Coin Market Cap. Like a lot of these projects are very, very highly valued. They're billion dollar plus companies for, uh, or projects. And so you've got a lot of growth potential. Um, and even even just pulling this up, having not looked at it in maybe a month, you'll see a lot of names on here that just weren't here a week or, or a month or a half ago. Um, oh gosh, let's go. Please, please. Here we go. You'll see a lot of projects go from 400 in market cap to no top of the list. And there's just a lot of potential in, in all these projects. And I think uh, Avalanche is a really great example of that. This company, this project, it effectively didn't exist, give or take, half a year ago, a year ago. It's like very new technology, and it's worth you know, $40 million. So if you invested it with a $100 million valuation, Fourteen billion. It's, you know, it's just like kind of the math of investing in early stage projects, and that's what a, a lot of these assets are: is the early stage projects. And so we're gonna kind of go through, and, and that's kind of the basis of looking at them. We've kind of covered the technical side of it, and if you want to get into actual trading, we have the revenue, we have the routes to do that now. If you want to go more into the deep development side of it, you now have the avenues and routes to do that. And what we're gonna look at going forward is what to really look for in these projects and what makes them different from one another and valuable. So, yeah. Cool, any questions? So I wonder how you, how you will answer this. When you're buying a share of Facebook, you're buying a portion of that company and a portion of future revenues, right? Um, what are you getting when you buy Bitcoin or Ethereum? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's even interesting. I can talk all day about this, but a lot of times when you buy a share of Facebook or whatever, you're actually not buying a share of Facebook or whatever. Um, it's kind of nutty how that works out. It's like the, I can talk all day, um, but at a high level, the way the centralized clearing works, a lot of times you don't actually get the stock you pay for. It's really interesting. We can talk all day about that. But yeah, so to your point, with most of these investments, most of these coins. It's just a number on that ledger on the big triple entry book, right? You just have a, 12 Bitcoin is a lot of money, but at the end of the day, it's just 12 on that big global ledger of all the Bitcoin holders, right? Uh, and that's what most of these projects are. It's just, at least a lot of them are just a big global ledger. 
And some of them have like functionality, you can run contracts, you can run programs, you can do all these cool things with files. Uh, and that's what most of, excuse me, the projects look like, because most of them aren't, aren't companies. They just, they aren't companies uh, for, for most of them. So yeah.